Hello and welcome back to Artful Bytes and to another video in this video series where I'm programming an embedded system from scratch, this Sumo robot. I've already done a couple of videos where I've introduced the project and talked about the hardware, so if you want to know more about that, you can watch the previous videos. In this video, I'm going to start finally getting into the software by talking about how I set up my development environment to be able to write code, compile it and load it onto the microcontroller of this Sumo robot. And the goal at the end of this video is to get to a point where I'm able to blink the LED on this evaluation board. Overall, I'm going to show two ways of setting things up. In this video, I'm going to focus on setting things up by using the integrated development environment provided by the vendor, in this case, Texas Instrument. And in the next video, I'm going to show how to set things up without relying on an ID, where I'm instead going to use a make file and access the toolchain directly from the command line. And that's the way I prefer to do it in my day-to-day -day work, because it has several benefits, but I will talk more about that in the next video. Before I go and install the ID, I want to first talk about this evaluation board, the MSP430 launchpad. If you watched the previous videos, you know that this Sumo robot is finished, it works, uh, the hardware is in place, there is a PCB with a microcontroller on it. So I could technically start programming this robot straight away and there is really no need for using this launchpad. But in a real project cycle, you typically don't have access to the hardware straight away. And as an embedded software engineer, it's common to start writing code before the hardware even arrives to be as prepared as possible when it actually arrives. And during this beginning stage of the project, it can be really useful to use evaluation boards like this. And while this isn't a full-blown professional project, I also started this project by building a prototype using the evaluation board and wrote quite a lot of code before I actually designed the PCB for it. And just to clarify, if you aren't familiar with evaluation boards, uh, an evaluation board is a board for evaluating some computer chip, for example a microcontroller, and it helps evaluation by providing things such as header pins, buttons, LEDs, and a program interface. Basically things that help you evaluate the different functionality of the computer chip. And this is not something unique to the MSP430. Most vendors provide some sort of evaluation board for their product to help customers evaluate their chip. And since the chip on the evaluation board is typically the same as the one you will use in your product, the code that runs on the evaluation board is also going to run on the real project. And this means you can write some of the code using the evaluation board and then transfer it pretty seamlessly to the real project. So even though I could start programming the robot straight away, in the coming videos, I am going to get started with the launch pad, the evaluation board and write most of the driver code using it before I move on to the actual PCB on the robot and I also hope that doing it this way will also make these videos a bit more general and isolated and perhaps easier to follow along to. With that rambling out of the way, how do I set up my computer to be able to write bare metal C code, compile it and load it onto the microcontroller on this launchpad? Well, Overall, the experience is necessarily not so different from writing and compiling a regular C program that runs on our host computer. Because when we compile a program to run on a microcontroller, we are still compiling it on our host computer. But the difference is that the compile output or the executable runs on our microcontroller, which has a CPU with a different processor architecture than our host computer, which typically has an x86 CPU these days. And this means that you need a special type of toolchain that supports the architecture that you're targeting, a so-called cross toolchain, including a cross compiler. Going down the IDE path, you don't need to care about these details too much because the IDE comes with this toolchain out of the book. It's more important when you're not using an IDE, so I'm not going to go into more details here and instead save it for the next video when I set things up without an IDE. Anyway, the idea that Texas Instruments provide for most of their microcontrollers, including the MSP430, is called Cold Composer Studio. It's Clips-based, and if you're used to any other IDE, it's similar. It has a console, an editor, and buttons to build and compile code. So now I'm going to head over to TI's website to get CC Studio set up. There's actually an option to use CC Studio from the cloud. Uh, I haven't tried that, but I guess it's some web application you can use from the web browser to evaluate CC Studio or something like that. Uh, I'm going to install this for Linux because I am on Linux. And as we all know, Windows is the worst operating system on the planet and Linux is superior in every way. 
No, but seriously, you could, of course, install uh, SysStudio on Windows as well. And there is actually some better support in the Windows version because it has support for some additional debug probes and so on. And you will not have any issues as long as you stay inside the IDE. But once you step outside the IDE, which I'm going to do in the next video, you will have a much better experience if you are on Linux because Linux provides a much better command line interface and overall allows you to better customize and automate your programming workflow. It has better utilities, it's easier to install programs and so on. I could probably list a hundred reasons for why you should be on Linux rather than on Windows if you are a programmer or a developer. But let's save that for another day. And to be honest, if you're interested in embedded systems, you should already be naturally drawn to Linux out of curiosity because it's an operating system that actually allows you to understand what your computer is doing as opposed to Windows, which is basically a black box with a graphical user interface. And in addition, lots of embedded devices are running some version of Linux these days, so called embedded Linux or Android. And having experience as a Linux user will be helpful when working on such systems. Okay, so let's get back to what we're actually doing here, installing CC Studio. Okay, so the download for the installer is done. So let's uh, unpack it. I'm running Ubuntu uh, 20.04 and like normally when you install packages on Linux, you can use uh, the package manager, but there is no package available for CC Studio. So that's why I'm installing it this way. And even if there was a package available, it would probably not be the latest version. So I would still download the installer this way to ensure that I got the latest version of CC Studio. So now I'm gonna change folder to the installer and then I'm simply going to run the installer from my uh, terminal. Accepting the agreement without reading it, obviously. And here it complains about some missing dependencies and I haven't installed any additional dependencies since I installed this Ubuntu or I'm pretty certain that I haven't. And even though it complains about these missing dependencies, I haven't had any issues when running CC Studio, but there may be some functions that doesn't work as they should unless these packages are installed. I'm not sure. I already have it installed inside my home folder under dev and tools. So for the sake of this video, I'm going to install it under the downloads folder. I'm going to do a custom installation because I don't want to install components that I don't need. And the only component I need is the one that contains the support for the MSP430 microcontrollers. And as I mentioned previously, the Linux version doesn't have the same support as the Windows version. So it's missing support for some of the evaluation boards here. And it actually says that it's missing support for the MSP430 launchpad, which is the one I'm using, but I've been able to use this launchpad with the Linux version of this studio without issues. So I'm not entirely sure what's not supported with the MSP430 launchpad. Okay, so the installation is done and here it says that we should run a script called install drivers to install the required drivers for the debug probes. I don't need to run this on Ubuntu. My debug probe works anyway. So I guess the, those drivers are already in place as part of the Linux kernel or something like that. So I'm not going to run this uh, script and I'm not going to create a desktop shortcut because I'm not using a desktop based uh, environment. But of course, if you are on stock Ubuntu or something like that, you might want to create a desktop shortcut. Okay, so this studio is installed. And since I installed it in the downloads folder, let's change the directory. And go to the Eclipse folder. And then we, I can launch this studio from here. Of course, I don't want to start this studio from the command line every time. So for my actual installation, I've made a system link to the executable. So I'm able to access it from my program launcher. But I will start it from the command line for the sake of this video. And I will also create a temporary workspace.
Okay, so this is what we are greeted with when launching Code Composer Studio. This is the start screen. And from here, you can create a new project or start with an example project for access some resources as well as development tools and so on. And as you can see, it looks like a regular ID. It has some things for saving files, building code, debugging code, and so on. So what I'm going to do now is find the example program for blinking an LED on this launchpad. I'm going to search for MSP430 and the exact version is this one. And at the top here is the example program for blinking an LED. So I'm going to import that. And since the Blink LED pro project is part of a larger software package called MSP430 Wear, we have to install that to be able to import it. So that's what I'm going to do now. And I'm only going to install the requested package. Yeah, so this is going to take some time as well. And now when I have the package installed, I can import the Blink LED project. And there we go. Okay, so now I'm going to connect the launchpad to my computer via the USB port here. And, and this basically connects my computer to the microcontroller via this uh, onboard debug probe. And for this to work, it's important that these bridges are connected in the right orientation. Okay, so the Blink LED project that I'm going to load onto this microcontroller now is basically going to configure one of the GPIO pins on this microcontroller to act as an output. And this GPIO pin is connected to an LED that's available on this board. It's going to be this LED over here. The code is then going to configure the GPIO pin as an output and then drive the GPIO pin high and low, uh, or in other words, between uh, zero and 3.3 volts. And this is then going to drive this LED to light up. Okay, so let's now build the code and load it to the microcontroller to see that it actually works. Okay, so now I've built the code and the code is flashed onto the microcontroller and the debugger has halted the CPU at the start. So let's resume the program to let it run. And as you can see, the LED is blinking. And we can pause the execution or suspend the execution. And as you can see, the LED stops blinking as expected. And then we can step through the code here if we want to. Yeah, now we are obviously going to be stepping quite a lot before it takes another iteration in this while loop because there is a for loop here with 10 thousand step. Okay, so in short, what this code is doing, at the top here, we are including a header file that TI provides, a vendor-provided header file. And this header file contains some useful defines that we can use when reading and writing to registers. Okay, so just as an example, let's look at the configure register for the watchdog timer. So yes, as you can see, here are some values for the watchdog timer control register that you can set to yeah, configure the watchdog timer in different ways. So going back to the main file again. And then um, we have a regular main function that is required by any C program. Yeah, and at the top here, they have defined an integer to hold the count value for the for loop here, which is basically a busy loop they've added to add some delay here between the toggling of the GPI pin. Because if we don't have a delay here, the toggling will be so fast that we can't see it. And they have put this as volatile because if we don't put this as volatile here, the compiler is smart enough to notice that this busy loop is not doing anything useful. So it would simply just optimize away this for loop here. And then in the next line, they stop the watchdog timer. And they have to do this because on the MSP430, there is a watchdog timer that is enabled by default. And this watchdog timer is basically a counter that counts up and then automatically resets sets the microcontroller when it reaches a certain count. And the normal purpose of a watchdog timer is to act as a recovery mechanism in case the microcontroller gets goes bananas or gets stuck 
for some reason, for example, in an endless while loop. But when using a watch timer for this purpose, you also have to make sure you refresh the watch timer so it doesn't reboot automatically when the microcontroller is working normally. But to avoid this in this simple project, they simply stop the watchdog timer here. And then, as I said, they configured the GPIO pin to act as output. So it's the pin zero of GPIO port one that is connected to the LED that we saw. And here's also another example of a useful register defined that is defined in this vendor provided header file. And then we get to the endless while loop where they use an XR operator to toggle the output pin on and off. And then the delays I've already mentioned. Okay, so this was as far as I wanted to take it in this video. Blinking an LED is a good starting point because with that I've confirmed that my development environment works, including the hardware. And from here I can really start coding away on my actual project. Overall, I think this studio is a decent idea. It has the basic stuff one needs and I haven't had much problems with it. And there are definitely worse ideas out there. And it's also good that TI removed the paid version of this studio so that you have full support when you install the free version now because previously in the free version the compiler output was limited to some smaller size but since it's an eclipse based slash java based IDE, it can feel a bit outdated in 2022 if you compare it to more modern ideas i mean eclipse was modern some 15 or 20 years ago and while i'm not a fan of being tied to a specific ide and i'm going to show you how to set things up without one in the next video i still like to set up the ide first because for one it's a quick way to get a baseline or reference confirming that my hardware and debugger and compiler works and secondly even if i try to stay out of an ide most of the time i may occasionally jump into it for certain tasks for example step debugging which you will notice throughout this video series okay so this was all for now if you have any questions or feedback please leave a comment below and see you in the next video.